Hi, everybody. Uh, this is a very exciting day for us. We are delighted to launch the ABCD Reburn In course. Um, we're going to go ahead and walk you through a little bit of background information so that we have everybody up on the same speed. Um, we're going to do a few introductions. We're going to give you some information about the course, and then we're going to get to the fun part, which is our Q&A session. Um, to start off the introductions, my name is Angie Laird. I am a professor of physics at Florida International University in Miami, um, also known as FIU. FIU is one of the 21 ABCD sites, and I serve as one of the site PIs along with Raul Gonzalez, who you'll actually get to meet later in the course. And I'm one of the lead organizers for this ABCD ReprintM course. And I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the team. Um, David, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Dave Kennedy. Uh, I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And I drew the short straw in the group of us who put in a proposal to uh, do a grant about a Center for Reproducible Neuroimaging Computation. So I lead a ragtag band of excellent researchers from around the country who are working on the uh, uh, reproducibility issues and trying to sort of solve the last mile problem to get more reproducible methods into the hands of, of the end users. So again, it was a pleasure to take the opportunity to work with the ABCD team and uh, put you know, this program together. Over the course of the semester, you'll be meeting a lot of the reproducible people, so I'll let them introduce themselves when the time comes. And so we also have Satra on the line. Satra, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. I'm Satra Ghosh. I'm a principal research scientist at MIT and an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. I'm part of the ReprintM team and happy to work with Angie, David, and others on this course in trying to bring reproducible practices on this immense and exciting data set. Uh, so look forward to working with everyone. I'll just stop there. And we have Jessica Bartley, who is our ABCD ReprintM program coordinator. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Bartley. Um, as uh, Angie mentioned, I am the poor program coordinator for this course. I'm also a postdoc with uh, Angie at Florida International University, and I'm really excited to help this course um, be a learning experience for everyone involved. Thank you, JB. Um, in the interest of time, I want to give a huge shout out to our teaching assistants who you will be able to meet individually um, as we move through, forward through the course. We have Adam and Dustin who are watching our webcast, so they're not here right now. We have James who is a Zoom attendee um, along with Christina, so that they are helping feed us Q&A questions um, on your side. And then we have Lisa here along with Taylor Salo. You guys wanna say hi real quick? Hi, um, looking forward to meeting all of you and Hoping that you guys enjoy the course. Yes, hello. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so as I mentioned, we want to get through some of the processes and administrative questions that are most relevant to this week one of the course. We do have a good number of submitted questions that we want to answer, so I'm going to try to move through this intro portion as quickly as possible. Um, if I go too fast, we're going to be uh, recording this session and posting it later today. And so you can rewatch it there, or you can always, always reach out to us directly. Before we go further, I want to bring our code of conduct to your attention. You can access the code of conduct on the main website, front and center on the first page. It's available as a Google Doc. Please take the time to review this document. We are created to commit in, uh, creating an inclusive environment where everyone is comfortable sharing their work, opinions, and perspectives. We want to engage with each other mindfully to ensure shared learning and collaboration. So the COC walks you through our guidelines and provides information for you for reporting issues related to the code of conduct and tells you how we'll respond. And this is a very important aspect of that. Okay, the next up is our pre-course survey. It's really short, but by asking you a few questions before and after this course, we're gonna be able to better uh, assess our success and report these measures to the NIH. The pre-course survey is available as a Google form shown here uh, for the observer students. To access it, go to the materials page of the website, click on week one, and it's there. Enrolled students should not take this Google uh, form course. We want you to take the pre-course survey in Canvas. So if you're an enrolled student and you took the course in the Google form by mistake, then no worries, not a big deal. 
but please do go and resubmit your responses in Canvas. Now, about half of the enrolled students have taken the survey in Canvas, and we very much thank you for that. But that means that half of you have not, so please do that soon. It's meant to be a pre-course survey, and the course is really starting today, so um, this is one way that you can help us make this course a success. Okay, so in terms of our weekly procedures, we've sent you a few emails and my guess is that if you've been spending a little bit of time on our website maybe you're a little bit overwhelmed maybe you're wondering where everything is maybe you think maybe you missed something um and so we get that that that's very understandable and we want to try to help with that bear in mind that we have two tracks for this course one is for the enrolled students and one is for the observer students you should know which one you are if you don't reach out to us um, if you are either an enrolled or an observer student and you've not been receiving any course emails, especially in the last week, then please reach out as soon as possible because we may not have your correct email address. And we are using a number of different platforms to disseminate these course materials, so we understand that this whole thing may be a little bit confusing, so let's walk through this. First, let's talk about what we're asking you to do each week. All videos for Session 1 are currently available. This is the first six weeks of the course. At the beginning of each week, you should watch the pair of videos for that week and read the course readings. As you see here on the website, this is where you can access those materials. There will be a weekly data exercise and the same exercises will be provided to everyone, whether or not you're enrolled or an observer student. You'll do the data exercise throughout the week and then enter your questions about all of the course content into the weekly Google Doc. And on Fridays, we'll close that Google Doc 30 minutes before the Q&A session starts. And that'll give us time to organize and collate the questions and get ready for these Friday sessions. And it's important that if you do have questions and you're an observer student, that you do go ahead and ask your questions in that Google Doc, because that's the only platform for observer students to ask their questions in the live session. The weekly Q&As like this will be held on Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the US. And that means 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, not 11 a.m. as I stated incorrectly during my lecture. Sorry about that, time zones are really hard. During the Q&A, your ABCD Repro and M team, the organizers will moderate a discussion between the weekly pair of instructors. The session's gonna be available via Zoom to the enrolled students. If you're an enrolled student, student and you're in the Zoom, we're gonna use the webinar format so that you'll see the panelists, which include the ABCD organizers, and the weekly instructors. Enrolled students are attendees who will not be seen other than a list of your names. Now, during the session, enrolled students can use the Q&A box. It should be there at the bottom of your little Zoom window. And our teaching assistants are gonna be monitoring this Q&A window, both as panelists and as attendees, um, so that we can make sure that we're catching all of those questions and that we're better equipped to answer them during the session. We have left the chat window enabled so that you can send messages to each other. Maybe you see a friend, colleague, someone you know and you wanna reach out and say hi, but we're not gonna be monitoring the chat window for the instructor questions, only the Q&A window, okay? Now each week we may not get to everyone's questions. If that's the case, we are going to post those questions to NeuroStars, hopefully by the end of the day or perhaps over the weekend um, if there are quite a few questions to answer. If you're an observer student or anybody else who's interested, you can watch the Q&A live via our webcast link. If you can't make it to the live sessions, if there are time zone issues or schedule conflict, then we'll be recording them and posting them to the website later in the day. Finally, also after the Friday session, we will then be releasing the data exercise for the following week. We want you to have as much time as possible to get ready for the next week's session. So that means that today is the first week's Q&A, after this session ends, we're going to be posting the data exercise for week two so that you have a full week to work on it before next Friday's Q&A. Cool? All right, in terms of our course platforms, I've been saying a lot of things. First, we recommend you spend time on the course website. That's where we recently added a good bit of our content. The lectures are there as video recordings via YouTube, along with the weekly readings, which are links to um, publications primarily, but also some additional resources. You'll be doing your weekly data exercises also. So where do you get those? Observer students will access the data exercises via Google Forms, which is posted on the course website for each week. 
enrolled students are going to do the exact same data exercise with the exact same quiz at the end, but they're going to access it in Canvas. You can also use Canvas to take your pre-course survey, all of which shows up under the assignments button. So basically, if you can't find it on the course website, it is probably in Canvas. Canvas quizzes we're going to use Canvas because it helps us uh, allow for the grading of the quizzes and to assess course completion and for sending you your certificate of completion. Um, now, some of you are already worried about your course grade and whether or not you're passing. Rest assured that we are only using the weekly quiz grades to assess how well we are teaching you. Your receipt of a course completion certificate only depends on whether or not you complete the assignments, not on your graded performance of those assignments. So here's the key, enrolled students who complete 70% of the weekly quizzes, thereby completing 70% of the weekly data exercises, will receive a certificate of completion at the end of the course. So again, not the grade, but just did you complete it at all? Was it submitted? We also know that some of you are experiencing challenges gaining access to ABCD data, and you're worried that it will affect your ability to complete the course. Also rest assured that uh, this is not the case, you will be able to see your certificate of completion. We are making allowances for how we structure these quizzes so that if it's something that requires ABCD data access, uh, we're making that a, a bonus quiz. Um, however, we are not able to allow you to participate in Project Week if you do not have access to ABCD data. But if you do have access and you do participate in Project Week, then we have decided that we will be providing you with a separate certificate of completion specifically for Project Week. And, and this is intended so as not to imply some sort of punitive system for those who aren't able to get access to ABCD data. Um, now to participate to, in Project Week, as we've mentioned, you need to get access to ABCD data. And to demonstrate that you have gotten that access, there is a data access certificate um, assignment in Canvas, and that will help us assure um, provide confirmation to us that you have been able to get access to that ABCD data. We're going to keep that open throughout the course until we get closer to project week. Um, we are going to try to keep that as open as possible and that will trigger whether or not your name gets added to the list of folks involved in project week. This is also available to you under assignments. Okay, so start at the website and if you're an enrolled student move on to Canvas. Um, in terms of additional resources that we have for you, we want to point you towards NeuroStars. NeuroStars is an excellent neuroimaging community discussion board. Um, folks use it for a lot of different things, but we have created a separate ABCD ReproNim category on NeuroStars, which we hope that you will use. Enrolled students are also given access to a Slack workspace. Please check your email for information on that. If you're an enrolled student and you have a question you want to ask the community, we ask that you take a moment to think about where you want to ask that question. If it's a general ABCD or ReproNim or ABCD ReproNim question that any member of the community might have, we ask that you post it to NeuroStars. This is an open forum, so it's likely that others might have the same question and they'll benefit from you asking that question and seeing the responses to it. Posting it to Slack means that only other enrolled students are gonna be able to see it and we'd like for our discussions to be as open and as accessible as possible. But if you have a question that relates specifically to the course or some aspect of the course that's specifically for enrolled students, then posting it to Slack is the appropriate thing. So that was fast. That was lightning fast. I get it. There was a lot of content in there. We do want you to go ahead and work through um, making sure that you have access to Canvas and Slack and NeuroStars. And, and that is mainly um, a good chunk of the week one quiz, confirming that you have been able to get through these things. If you are having problems, please reach out to us, either on Slack if you've gotten through there, um, on um, email at info at abcd-repronim.org or emailing any one of all of our organizers. Um, all right, that is enough for me right now. I am going to hand it back over to Dave Kennedy for the next step here. Great, thank you, Angie. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things. Um, most of the stuff was covered in Angie's introduction. Uh, you all have been given you know, information about how to access the ABC data, and we already know that some can and some can't. But again, the funding for this uh, initiative you know, is you know, sort of targeted to helping the community use ABCD data. 
So that's really why we focus on that a lot because that's, you know, this is you know, an initiative to try to promote that. And again, even if you can't get that, there's elements of the data exercises that, you know, at least document your understanding of the ABCD data, even if you don't access it. But again, we're trying to get as many people to access that data set as possible. Um, but the other thing that goes with, with much data comes great power and also a great uh, opportunity to uh, accidentally do things that aren't you know, permitted. So um, we get uh, uh, harassed a lot in a good way. Uh, and so we need to p pass on you know, the importance of data security to everyone. Please do not do anything that isn't permitted by the, the, the data access. Do not share data, do not share derived things, uh, do not put things in public you know, spaces. Uh, this investment in this data set is very large. The investment in keeping our subjects anonymous uh, is exceedingly high. And again, the, the whole study works because of the subjects uh, participation and the subjects comfort with that participation. So data security you know, is the highest, you know, amongst the highest things that we can, can really re promote and remind you. And so occasionally things get a little tricky and the data access is you know, sometimes not as easy as one would like. But again, this is all you know, trade-offs for data security, which is just you know, of paramount importance. Uh, Angie already mentioned that there's the weekly data exercises and uh, the you know, with and without ABCD variants thereof. The other thing about the data exercises I wanted to qu quickly uh, say is, you know, we know everyone is working on different computational platforms and what you have access to, you know, can be variable. So for the enrolled students, we will be, you know, in a week or so uh, standing up a Jupyter Hub, a common, you know, web-based, you know, platform that accesses, you know, cloud computing and lets all of our enrolled students via their GitHub account you know, access a, you know, computational space. In that space, we can control the environment. We know exactly what software you have. We know exactly what uh, operating system you're working under, and we can uh, you know, take care of, of that kind of stuff so that the data exercises you know, can be carried out in a way that doesn't overly tax what you have to do onto your own computing. That being said, you know, after the course is over, you're going to want to be able to do these things. So we do encourage you to be able to do these things at home, but we don't want getting you know, certain things installed to be a barrier to moving along in the course. So this Jupyter Hub is really the common place you know, that you'll be able to access that. The other data thing to remember is that the large amount of ABC data is hosted on the Amazon uh, cloud uh, hosting mechanisms. Uh, it is a very large you know, data set. And uh, the preference is to not have everyone in the world download the 100 terabytes of data to their own you know, spaces that uh, incurs you know, costs and replication of, of effort. Being a cloud-based resource, doing cloud-based computing is very important. And so the Jupyter Hub is a cloud-based instance, which uh, uh, works with that. So again, there's things that will teach you, you know, through the course you know, about you know, the differences in working with cloud-based you know, instances in terms of you know, data management and com computational management. But so that's uh, you know, sort of why you know, we want to do that is to make sure that the, um, the access to that data you know, is unfettered, but also secure and also you know, least costly in terms of data transfer types of things. So I think that's the end of my introductory things. There's lots of questions that will come up. Uh, they'll be asked in one of the venues that uh, Angie foreshadowed and uh, I'll turn things back over to, I guess, uh, Jessica next. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, so I just wanna quickly um, parallel what Angie said about make sure that you, check your email and make sure that you're getting the emails that we're sending. We're going to send out um, an email each week with information about what to expect that week um, and it's going to have important links to it. So if you're not receiving that in your inbox, it may be going to spam. Your university or institution may be filtering it out before it can get there. So just shoot us an email at info at abcd-repronym.org and um, let us know so that we can, um, we can try and troubleshoot that problem. But on that same vein, I wanted to speak directly to the enrolled students um, just really quickly. Um, in the email that we're gonna be sending out later today for week two of the course, um, there's gonna be a link in there to sign up for the TA Q&A sessions. Um, those are places where you can ask the teaching assistants in the courses, in the course about um, 
questions you may have on the data exercises, about general questions you may have on the course. Um, and you need to sign up for one of the five times that we have um, opened up for those sessions. Um, and there's going to be a sign up link in the email that I'll send out later today for that. Um, the reason I'm promoting it right now is because I want you, if you're an enroll student, to sign up for that um, as soon as you can because it is in a first come, first for basis. We're going to have a cap of 25 students for each of those sessions. And we have kind of attempted to strategically pick times that would be good times for people that are all across the globe because we have a lot of um, both United States students and international students in this venue. So um, when you get that email later today, just click on the sign up link and choose the time that works best for you. That's the one that you're going to be, uh, I guess, signed up for for the remainder of the course. Um, and that's my little promotion of that. So I will, I think right now on the agenda is answering some questions on air, right? Exactly. All yep. right, let's do it. The good stuff. Okay, so we do have a number of instructors who are on this end of the call. I am gonna ask that Satra and JB Poline go ahead and turn your cameras on and unmute yourself because my understanding from Javier is that by unmuting yourself, that's what allows folks to see you and we would like everybody to see your lovely faces um, because we have a good number of questions. Uh, some of the questions are about the course itself. Um, I'm hoping we got most of those answered. I'm trying to go through the Q&A right now and answer some of them via text. So anybody who's on the Zoom call um, should be seeing that we're trying to answer some of our questions there. The ones that are left over, a good chunk of them are having to do with things more on the ReproNim and reproducibility end. Um, so I want to make sure that we have Satya, JB, and Dave here ready to answer some of these questions. I'll start at the top. First question, why do reproducible tools predominantly use Python? Are there equivalents in R that are also being created? Maybe I can take up that. I'm sure others will uh, can chime in as well. I'm uh, taking this first question because I might have to leave soon for another call. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so, no, absolutely not. Uh, reproducible tools are not specifically for Python. I don't know. It is. It's. It, I think it's a bit of a community sort of move. Uh, like you know, Python community has moved more in that direction in some ways. Uh, for instance, uh, but but for instance, the uh, Jupyter uh, notebook uh, is definitely uh, the first kernel for the Jupyter notebook was Python one, uh, because Fernando was a Python programmer, uh, Python developer. But but uh, but basically, all the languages uh, can adopt the uh, best practices for reproducibility. Uh, so for uh, so typically R, for instance, have a, has a lot of uh, like uh, uh, embedded features or and uh, and packages that are helping that respect as well with uh, Swift and, uh, and others, uh, other tools. So so it's not it's it, and and some of the tools are, uh, you know, completely agnostic. Uh, like uh, for instance, Git uh, and GitHub and uh, those uh, uh, sort of like a, uh, I would say a provenance tracking of, of uh, version of content tracking systems uh, and collaborative systems. They are, uh, you know, completely agnostic, but you know, on the uh, on on the type of uh, uh, text file that you have, or, or even like files that you have. Uh, some of the tools, uh, like for instance, MATLAB requires a license. So uh, with MATLAB, it's sometimes a bit harder to like you have a, a, an additional barrier in some ways to uh, uh, relaunch or reproduce uh, something that has been uh, created in MATLAB. Uh, but you know, MATLAB also has, you know, does you know, some best effort to actually uh, make sure that you have like compilers. The, the, the compiled MATLAB code, for instance, could be run without MATLAB uh, uh, license and, and so on. So, so uh, yes, for some reason there is like a, you know, like a more on the Python side because um, uh, many of the, uh, the the tools have been developed in Python and uh, uh, and and historically I think um, uh, Satra and, uh, and many others are you know we are more like in on the uh, we have, we have switched from MATLAB or some something else to Python and maybe in a few years we will be switching to Julia or something else but uh, so it's 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 a it's a bit more like a, you know it's a a historical plus a community sort of like a movement aspect, but it's uh, it's uh, reproducibility is definitely not uh, sort of uh, uh, tied to Python only. And my only addition to that, like, again, is we're sensitive to the fact that we tend to be a little Pythonic in our our work, and but are aware of these issues. So again, we you know, would 
like to ask the community as you know we go through these things you know to help us collect you know the parallel matlab parallel r parallel other ways to be accomplishing these same things so we don't end up being quite as pythonic you know sounding as clearly it sounds sometimes there's another question that's somewhat related to this right now. Um, so what are the downsides to using open source analysis programs, if any? Are there any criticisms that you want to mention, places for improvement? Option. I could take that on. Uh, I don't think there are any direct downsides. As with anything that's out openly, you have to be careful about how much testing is done with that software, how much validation is done with that software. But that's going to be true not just for open tools, it's going to be true for any closed tools as well. And in fact, with the open ecosystem that JB just referred to, some of the most fringest testing are in place for some of the tools we use. I'm not going to say it's 100% across the community, but to a large extent, you can see that there's significant effort put into making sure that the tools do what they're supposed to do. So I wouldn't say there is any downside directly. You have to evaluate each tool through the lens of how well tested and how well validated they are. And maybe the only quick uh, addition to that is the uh, support aspect. Um, you know, like uh, if you're paying your license to a company that uh, maybe that company will have uh, capacity to put some uh, uh, support on, on the product in some ways, uh, I would, I should add right away that the, the, you know, the open source community is also giving a lot of very good support, sometimes even better than companies. So, so you know, even in that sort of direction of thought, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's not clear that uh, open source is not doing better. Um, there's another reproductive question that I think JB could tackle. Um, do you think cognitive neuroscience should abstain from small end studies because of their lack of power or could they still be valuable for exploration and meta-analyses meta in the future when we fix the issues of transparency and publication bias? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, are small studies still valuable? Uh, I would say yes, uh, especially if they, uh, I mean, it's, it's very clear that the, uh, uh, the results are, you know, like have a high degree of of uh, uncertainty, I think, uh, like if it's well communicated in that way, and if it's like pertaining for like a specific subgroup, or like you know, if you, uh, you know, the, sometimes uh, small studies are by sense because of the nature of the sampling uh, aspect of the of the population. Uh, so, so yes, uh, they, they are valuable. Uh, be careful that even you know, like uh, you know, like it means that you will have to actually rely on, as, as you said, like meta analysis and and uh, and, and postdoc and. Uh, uh, or, you know, sometimes you can also borrow a bit of information from the literature using some uh, sort of Bayesian uh, tools as well. You can say, hey, you know, we've seen this and this, so we have a little bit of a prior and uh, we can, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more uh, certain. Uh, but those, are, those things are, you know, like, uh, not, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, small studies will always have like a high degrees of variability, uh, except if in that very, very small study population, there's extremely small variance for some reason, like, you know, like, a, and, um, and so it's, it's a balance of a signal to noise ratio, right? Uh, um, uh, but at the same time, if you have like a high signal to noise ratio with a small n, you're not sure where that you got that small signal ratio just by chance. Uh, so if the true signal is very high, that's fine. <laughs> if the uh, if the observed signal to noise ratio is high, that's uh, you know with a small n, you're still you're still a, a bit uncertain of the uh, of the result. Thank you. Um, should we go with one more reprinum question and then segue to ABCD, or should we tackle some ABCD specific questions? Let's do another reprinum. I like those. I think those are really important. We want to make sure we get through those. Cool. So there's another really interesting question. So this one says, is there perhaps a danger in focusing on reproducibility in a vacuum, i.e. without consideration of correctness? We could end up with re reproducibly incorrect findings. What gets measured is what improves. Recent machine learning competitions have been based on atlases um, where any competent anatomist quickly realizes their forward quality and it is well known that most non-linear non warp al algorithms do not align cortical gray matter with one exception. Um, anatomy is hard and most people hate it, so they focus on the parts they like, such as writing more computer programs. Anybody wants to tackle that one? I mean, I guess I'll start at the high level, you know, bit, is that, again, that's why we always have to be a little bit careful of reproduce what, you know, uh, reproducing things that, you know, re-execution of a bogus finding is only the start to the community figuring out if that's a bogus finding or, a, you know, a significant finding or not. 
So both of these levels we try to get at is, you know, expressing exactly what we've done more clearly so that that re-execution can be set up. But that's really just then the base platform for varying that, you know, changing the data, changing the approach uh, in ways that are, you know, hopefully better at, uh, in, in a principled way, which is hopefully a better way to you know, find out if it's a you know, biologically meaningful uh, difference than, than just the willy nilly, whatever happens to show up into the published literature, which is not very well described and you know, is often cherry picked in various ways. Maybe I'll add just a couple of sentences to that. Uh, I think one of the question, a key words in that question is the notion of uh, consideration of correctness. Uh, in many things in neuroimaging and other cognitive science studies, we don't know what correct is. Uh, we don't have ground truth for various things. So one has to kind of look at this in the context of how you determine validity of a finding. So reproducibility is just one part. Transparency kind of gives uh, a notion. And the kind of things that uh, the repronym tools help you kind of break down repro reproducibility into, things like robustness, uh, things like generalizability and replication allows you to think about correctness from those lenses and, and might by itself might give you better clues as to whether a scientific finding should hold. And, the, and maybe the last uh, little thing could be added, uh, and I'm so very sorry, I will have to run after that. The, the uh, uh, replicability is sometimes taken as more like a, a general word that encompasses uh, replicability on other data uh, generalizability on, you know, uh, possibly other uh, software and, and, and those things. So, so it's really like the, the fact that you uh, find again the same, uh, the same answer uh, uh, through uh, different data sets, different tools, uh, uh, different methodologies and all those things. That, that is what, you know, at the end, you know, correctness is, is emerging from. Uh, so I think that's, that's, uh, uh, you know, often, often we use the term reproducibility and we mean uh, like a, sort of like a, not only rig executability, but also like a replication aspect. Uh, I think that's, uh, um, which is more like on, on the line of uh, correctness. Thank you. Um, there's, another, um, there's another question that's, I guess, a bit more high level, but I think very interesting. And this one is sort of, I guess, teetering on both the repronym and ABCD side. So um, in open data sets, different people can test many different hypotheses without correcting for the number of statistical tests performed by others before. Do you think this could lead to an inflated type one error rate? If so, would this lead to some sort of data set decay? That's such an interesting question. I have to think. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it is it is a question that uh, I've been asking myself actually, and then uh, uh, um, it depends a little bit if um, uh, you. Uh, you are investigating exactly the same angle and the same sort of like, you know, uh, uh, question in, in the data or, or not. I think that's, uh, that is the, uh, to me, the, like, a, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're asking a question that is really related to another question uh, and, you know, and you're finding that basically you will have like a, a correlated answers in some ways. Uh, and to some extent, you're, yeah, that, you know, that question has already been partly reviewed and the data have already been partly used to answer that sort of things. Uh, if you're investigating something that is really orthogonal or like a completely novel in, in the respect, then I think that that decay hasn't happened yet in some in some ways. Um, uh, yeah, so I would yeah, yeah my two cents on that. And again, it will come up in your lecture, you know, later in the course. But the site, one of the tools that you know is important in this area is this uh, pre-registration type of thing to get to sort of the countability. You know, again, exploratory analysis, you know, data decay is one thing, but to the extent, you know, we can move more towards, you know, uh, registered reports and the uh, pre-registration types of concepts, uh, we can really try to at least manage a little bit the, you know, uh, number of tests and the correction for number of tests in, in these big data sets. That won't solve it, but it's at least one of the tools we have in that area. Um. And so we have Damien Fair, who's actually also on the call, but he has his video off, which is why he's not showing up to everybody else. Damien, you've made a comment in the, um, in the private chat window. Would you like to pop on and maybe make that comment to everybody? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I was, it, was, it was primarily related to the, the fantastic question that came before the, the prior one, which I spent a lot of my career, unfortunately, having to deal with. 
And that's, a, and I think it kind of summed down to the, the importance of getting rid of systematic artifacts in our data because systematic artifacts are highly reproducible and often give us a sense of, of like we found something great when it's, it's really artifactual. And um, so that you have in order, it, you just as much have to, particularly in MR data, you have just as much have to focus on squeezing out and getting rid of these reproducible systematic artifacts to know what biological phenomena are actually reproducible in your data. So I, I just was kind of emphasizing that because I think that was a bit about what the question was, was highlighting. Thank you for that. Um, folks, you'll get to hear from Damien in, in one of the weeks coming up very quickly. He's going to be telling us all about the imaging measures in ABC data. So thank you for that, Damien. Yep. Um, okay, so next up, I see one that I think is is interesting because, um, well, here, let's get into it. The Rebro in Brainverse, Nice Man, Neuroblast Pipeline seems like it has the potential to be a challenging data engineering problem if one is attempting to implement the approach in their lab. Is it best to try and establish this on our own as scientists or consult the imaging center we collect our data from? I'm going to invite Satra to uh, start on that one. If I can only unmute myself. So I'll start off with the first statement being, you don't have to implement every pieces of all of the pipeline. If you can implement even a few pieces of it, that's better than not implementing any of it. Uh, for some of those pieces, yes, you will want to talk to your imaging center. For example, the repro in piece is one that would benefit everybody in the center if they did that, uh, relatively simple to implement and you can do so. The remaining pieces get more challenging depending on who is doing what kind of analysis and what kind of training and skill set they have. So depending on the background, this course is as good as any in helping improve some of those concepts uh, around those remaining pieces. But I would say the first thing is take a few of these pieces and some of the repronym uh, sites have more information about the details of each of the piece take things that directly apply to your research as a starting point, some are more low hanging fruit than others, take those and start with those. And then you can kind of learn about the more challenging pieces. But yes, our stack uh, for computational tools has gotten richer and denser and deeper over the years. And it's becoming harder for many, buddy, many people to appreciate that complexity and use it efficiently. So hopefully a course like this will help you do some of that. Uh, but it's something that each person still has to take on in improving how they use these tools to affect their research. And the reality and, is that the culture at different imaging centers varies incredibly. There are, are some centers that um, may not be necessarily interested in going the repro in place and some places that are very enthusiastic about doing that. So it really does depend on where you are. Um, and, and, you know, the leadership at your imaging center and the relationships therein. Part of the purpose of, you know, our curriculum in general and, you know, this course is to get the end users to know about these things. And then collectively, if you think, you know, yes, you can do your pieces, great. If you think your site, you know, wants to and is convinced that this is worth, you know, the trouble, then again, that's where the Reaper and team can help, you know, you know in fact, is a word I shouldn't be using uh, to inoculate you know, sites against irreproducibility. Uh, and again, there's help and assistance in trying to do that deep down into you know, the core you know, high performance computing to the connection to the scanners and the connection to your data collection and red cap and all that kind of stuff it gets very complex. But if a center and to some extent, you know, ultimately, we want people to go that way eventually. So to the extent that helping convince you that that's a good idea and helping you do that you know, if you have become convinced is part of the mission of Reprenim. Okay, so at this point, we have a good number of course questions. I wanna see if we can knock these out pretty quickly. Uh, next up is what is the last day to gain access to the ABCD data set to participate in project week? The last week of the last Q and A session where we'll be joining together with you is on Friday, February 26th. The following is the first week of March, and so everybody's going to be taking a week off then to get ready for Project Week. Um, and then Project Week starts March 8th and goes to the 12th. 
if you could get access and complete that um, certification assignment in Canvas by that Friday, February 26th, the last Q&A day, I don't think we'll have any problem rolling you into Project Week. Um, we will do whatever we can to accommodate folks as late as possible. Um, but if you could really try to aim to have that done by the end of February, that would help us out. Um, we know it's a lengthy process. It takes your institutional signing official to sign off on the certification. Then you have to upload it to ENDA and have it approved by their data access committee. The part that takes a good amount of time is getting it signed by your institutional official. And there may be a series of hoops that you have to jump through at your own institution. So please get started on this now. We already have a good chunk of enrolled students who have uploaded their assignment and have demonstrated that they already have access. Um, and so we're excited for those folks. For those of you who are still working on it, um, please go ahead and get started on that now if you haven't already because it takes a while to figure out who it needs to go to, who needs to review it. Lots of times there are institutional procedures that it has to go through legal and it has to go through tech and there are a number of different people who have to sign off on it before it gets approved and officially signed. Um, but if you could get it to us by the end of February, we should be good to go and allow you to um, participate. Just keep us posted if you're working on it and you know there are any hiccups and um, so that we're aware that maybe maybe you're having in progress and you're working on it as opposed to someone who doesn't have an FWA and isn't going to even attempt it, okay? Um, all right, so will there be opportunities for TAs to give feedback on project topics for project week? Yes, um, we haven't really talked about what that's gonna look like. We are gonna be providing you with a weekly TA, TA session where we encourage you to ask questions about the data exercises. If you have a question about possible projects, um, during project week, absolutely feel free to throw those out there. One of the cool things about this course is by front loading all of this content before we do the actual work of working on our projects together, is that we have plenty of time to let these project ideas sort of bloom and grow and turn into something um, really exciting that there's true consensus on. Um, so we anticipate to have discussions with you either on Slack or in the TA Q&A sessions or even in these weekly weekly in sessions with the instructors. Um, feel free to start throwing ideas around amongst each other and um, thinking about these now, but we will definitely be focused on developing the project ideas more towards January, at the second half of the course, when we're really good getting closer to project week. Let's see. Lisa, what do you think we should do next? Um, I thought we could, there was one specific ABCD question that I thought could be useful. Um, so in the overview video and papers, it states that protocols will evolve as the cohort matures. Are these changes in protocol comparable to previous? Um, I.e. if a protocol changes as the age increases, is it comparable to previous years for longitudinal analysis? What exactly shifts as the age increases? Is there something we should keep an eye out for? And also in respect to changes in protocols as issues arise. So this is an excellent question. I love this question. Um, so let me give you an example of how things might change. When you have nine and 10 year old kids and you ask them about substance use, you may ask them questions like, have you ever had a sip of alcohol? And they'll say no. And you'll say, okay, moving on. And then as those kids turn into 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds, and you say, have you ever had a sip of alcohol? And you say, yes, then that unfolds the next level of questions, you know, to ask things about, well, how often, what was it, and who were you with, and when? Um, and so for the substance use module, particularly, the timeline follow back, it, 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 the questions that get asked changed on what, what answers the child gives. Um, so the protocol changes as the children age because they will start having these new experiences. Um, my, my sort of summary answer to this question is that these are exactly the type of details that we will be answering in the weekly lectures. So the way that we've set up this course is that we want you to understand what ABCD data are. 
So we have separate lectures on the substance use assessments. That's um, the one given by Krista Lizdahl. We have one on the imaging measures. We have one on the neurocognitive assessments, the um, physical and mental health and demographics. Um, we have separate lectures to describe different aspects of ABCD data. And part of that description includes how that protocol changes as the child ages from nine to 10 years old to 19 to 20 years old. So we will definitely be getting into that into a more detailed format. Um, although the detailed protocols are available on the ABCD website if you want more a, of an at a glance um, picture of this. Um, that question just disappeared. Did I get all of it or was there more that I might, I might have missed a piece of it? That was it, that was it. I just, I, I marked it as done. And um, Mohab in the chat also said that uh, one of the things that changes um, as the participant gets older is the consent process. Correct. Once they reach um, adolescence, uh, age 13, yes, they will sign an adolescent assent. Um, I, let me back up. When the child goes through the initial consent process, the parent handles the consent form, the child at age 9 to 10 handles the child assent form. Once we hit 13 years old, there is an adolescent assent form that gets entered into it. And then when the child becomes 18 years old and becomes an adult, then uh, they will complete an adult consent form at that time. So we, we do have established um, human subjects policies and procedures to reflect that we are with these youth for quite a while. And they are, as they move through this journey of being children to adolescent to adults. Um, there's a question for that David Kennedy could answer. So um, I am aware that there is a scanner difference between sites, but until I listened to Dr. Kennedy's lecture, I didn't know that operating systems could affect brain volume calculations. Do we know what operating systems generated the brain volumes? Is it only one site or multiple? So for the ABCD data, uh, the annual releases, you know, include you know pre-processed you know data which comes from a single site analysis so that you know machine variants so the data analysis is done centrally so that is all uh, centralized um, if you take you know the individual data yourself uh, then you'll have to deal with you know different operating systems and things like that and so one of the things you'll get into is one of the ways one of the tools you know that tries to combat this uh, operating system variance is to use things like containers and virtual machine types of things where regardless of what you're base hardware platform is, we can use a more stable you know, environment for the software that you run. So really that's the emerging you know, technology to try to not force everyone into the same operating system, but at least control and understand exactly the operating system that's being used. And again, because the details of the operating systems, you know, where things can change are very subtle and you know, very hard to track. So by locking those down, regardless of where they're locked is really you know, the, one of the keys to being able to convey to someone else what you've done and explore this variance you know, to see if it's significant or not and, and deal with that as a you know, covariate going forward. Satro, I'll add any to that. Just a note that there is an interaction between operating systems and algorithms. So it's not just using the same algorithm on the same operating system as one way, but also kind of understanding the variation caused by different algorithms. They might all be uh, giving you brain volume, but may, they might be giving different brain volumes. So kind of speaking to Damien's point again, we're always trying to figure out artifacts in various places. Uh, these artifacts can arise from various sources. And so it's not just the operating system, but also the algorithms and their interaction that has to be taken into account. So I want to jump in and answer a bunch of these course questions, and I'm going to see if I can do them as briefly as possible so that we can get to get through all of these. Um, let, let me do, let me go through this. In our project proposals, what are the concrete ways of indicating that you will focus on reproducible methods? We're going to be covering that with all of the different ReproNIM lectures. And so I guess my response there is bear with us. You're going to get instruction on that, and we hope that you will be able to become familiar with these tools, fold them into your project proposals, and become comfortable in using them during project week. Uh, what computational techniques will we use, will we learn to analyze our data? Will these be specific to longitudinal data? We do have a separate lecture just on longitudinal data. It is, I believe, in week 13 of the course, and or maybe it's week 12, might be week 12. So we're going to have a separate uh, uh, lecture on longitudinal data. 
We're also going to have a separate lecture on machine learning approaches. And so that particular week is going to be very analysis intensive. One of the decisions that we had to make when structuring this course is, you know, there are um, lessons that we need to teach about ABCD data. There are repronym ph philosophies and tools and resources. And then there are analysis methods. And so we are not as heavy on teaching you the analysis methods as perhaps some other courses are. But what we are heavy are is that agnostic to the analysis approach that you will be using, we will be teaching you how to do those analyses in a reproducible fashion. And so that's the emphasis there. Um, there will be bits, dribs and drabs of different analysis techniques woven into the course with an emphasis on machine learning, with an emphasis on longitudinal. Um, but that won't be necessarily the primary focus of, and now this analysis method, and now that analysis method. Um, there are other resources out there for you to learn those. Will we also be learning how to analyze neuropsychological and demographic data as well? Yes, absolutely. There are separate uh, lectures specifically on the neurocognitive assessments and on the demographic assessments. We'll be teaching you about those data. Again, not necessarily a specific analysis method will be taught. We feel that it is our responsibility to be sort of agnostic to that um, as those depend on your research questions. But we are happy to facilitate discussion and engagement with you about you know, is there a match between your research question and your proposed analysis approach? And so we can talk more about that later. Okay, then getting into some of these um, more quick answer ones, will, be, will we be able to see the correct answers for the quizzes after they're due? It should populate that as soon as you submit your quiz, it lets you know what you got right and what you missed and what the correct answer was. So if you're having trouble seeing that after you've submitted the quiz, then let me know so that we can try to fix that. But that that's how it has been set up. So those should be uh, immediately accessible to you. When is each quiz due? Um, we would like to see you complete it at least one week after this lecture. So like we've set the, um, uh, you know, hypothetical due date for this week's quiz to be next week. Um, we're trying to keep the due dates themselves open because you have busy schedules. You have a lot going on. You have other responsibilities. Uh, we're, we are not here to think that the, this ABCD Repronym Repro course is all that you're doing. So if you fall behind a little on one week and need to play catch up in another week, we want to make those quizzes available to you so that this is sort of a um, play as you go sort of thing. Uh, so, so there won't be any formal due date on the quizzes. Um, Let's see, is the genomic data available to us? If so, how do we access it? Um, I'm not necessarily the best person to answer this question. I, Dave, did you know the answer to this one? No, um, I don't. It's that a one. special permissions thing, yeah. yes? Uh, perhaps Enda would be the appropriate person to ask that. Uh, they're they're gonna be given their special session with us in what, two weeks? And we, we can take that question on to online and we know people who should be able to answer that question. Yeah. That, that ought to be a knowable answer, just no one. So we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll make sure that answer gets pushed out. All right. I did a bunch of those there, I know, didn't I? All right, Lisa, do you want to yeah. send out? I was looking through some of them, seeing what we could kind of get out of the way before 2 p.m. Um, oh, this is an important one to answer. So do you have any suggestions for how observer students should download and analyze data if not on the Jupyter node? I can take that on. Uh, the Jupyter node runs a container. That container is openly available. So if you know how to run containers on whatever service you have, whether it's your laptop or your HPC center, you should be able to do some of the things using that container in your local environment. Uh, observer students may not, if you have access to the ABCD data through your own duck, you'll be able to do the direct things. Uh, and I think this is related to another question. Can project work will, uh, be done with data sets uh, that are not the ABCD data set? And we're gonna try and design some of the things so that it can be done. Not everything in the project can be done with other data sets. For example, there'll be a session on DEEP that comes up and DEEP requires access to ABCD 
data and dust. So we will try to make as many of the not directly dependent on ABCD things uh, available for doing with other data sets. And I just want to chime in quickly right there, um, just to clarify uh, everything that Satra just said, um, totally accurate, uh, but I think should be noted that um, we're trying to make the data exercises um, something that can be completed with ABCD data or HPC data or some kind of open source data, but the project week itself will be specific to ABCD data. So we can't do the project week with HPC data. Um, there's another quick question. So were pain related measures collected in year three? Would we have access to it by March 2021 or earlier? I don't know the answer to that. Um, that is something that we can, I'll, I'll look into that and I'll make sure that that gets pushed out. I don't know that there were any pain measures, but I, I'll dig into it a little. I do believe the annual release three is scheduled to come up in late-ish November, somewhere during this course. If those pain measurements will be part of that, the, again, is details we'll have to uh, look into. Right. Cool. There is another question. So um, I have more questions about data decay and practical steps to tackle this. If not today, will this be part of what we do in the course or talk about more? E.g., will we be practicing? Will we be practicing using sequential comparison correction methods or another option? So a bit of this might come up in that machine learning lecture, uh, just as an educational point. Uh, I think this is a kind of thing that could be looked at from a project perspective as well. Uh, and in addition, I think this is an excellent question for Neurostars uh, to post there and kind of discuss potential solutions around it. Uh, on the previous relation to this question, uh, I had posted uh, something that uh, one of the panelists had posted, which was a paper from Russ Poldrag's group in Eli Sciences looking at data decay. So hopefully between those things and Neurostars, you'll get some answers to that. But in terms of the context of this course, I think Project Week and that machine learning lecture might be something that's of relevance. Um, we have three minutes left. Um, I don't know if you want to tackle another question or... Let's do at least one more. Cool. Um, I guess here's another one that's more ReproNim related. Um, does testing sensitivity to measures within ReproNim help with the generalizability concept and the ability to create a spectrum for a biomarker of interest to understand how a smaller subset could behave based on the generalized results established in a larger sample that is more representative of the heterogeneity of the real world? I'm going to let Dave take that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to uh, dance this one a little bit. The, the general answer is yes. I mean, the population and the developmental trajectories are definitely places for clues to, to the types of uh, biomarkers that one might be, might be after. But this, again, I think the answer also relates to the earlier question about, you know, smaller sample size and, you know, compared to big sample size. There's a whole workshop that we should probably share the, uh, the uh, video from about, you know, this you know, are we constrained now to only looking for small, uh, small effect sizes in these big samples? Uh, but, uh, oh, my short-term memory is not great. So uh, the question was, remind me of the salient thing I should attempt to answer other than saying, that's a great question and we'll talk about it. <laughs> uh, the other salient bit to this was whether that small sample size could be seen in the context of a larger sample size uh, to see how valid perhaps an inference on the small sample size could be. Yeah, and again, I think the driver here is effect size. You know, one of the reasons why we need such huge samples to see certain types of things is we're looking for very subtle, you know, effect sizes that have drivers that are, um, you know, bigger than you know, age and, you know, sex and, you know, SES and IQ and genetic ancestry are all larger factors often than the thing, thing we're looking for. And so that drives us into these, you know, very large uh, studies for very small effect sizes. I think one of the key explorations now is, you know, are there better combinations of the data that yield things with larger effect sizes uh, so that the ability to generalize them to smaller you know, studies, uh, you know, can be, can be pursued. And, uh, you know, so that I think is the opportunity to discover combinations and you know, unique you know, aspects of the data which generate larger effect sizes for use later on. 
So I think we have run out of time. Um, we hope this was helpful to you. We wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, we hope that you find this course to be helpful in your furthering your research agenda and we're excited to continue this journey with you. Um, so moving forward, we're gonna make the week two quiz available later today and we will see you next week to talk about the week two lectures and data exercises.